And we are here with Naomi Novik. Uh, Naomi, welcome to Fast Forward. Hello, thanks. It's great to be here. I'm glad you uh, were able to find some time here at Balticon to uh, <laughs> join us here and, yes, and consent to the interview. Yeah. Uh, well, let, let's start. Um, His Majesty's Dragon was the first book in the Temeraire series. Mm -hmm. The hardback, which came out, I think, only in, in England, yes, that's right. uh, was, was called Temeraire. Mm -hmm. And these are fascinating books. They're, they're what, Napoleonic War with Dragons. Yes. And one of the things I loved was the way you built that into the society. I mean, the research must have been a lot of fun on these. Yes, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, I've always been a fan of this particular era. Um, Jane Austen is one of my favorite writers um, from way back when. Um, even before her, Georgette Heyer, um, Georgette Heyer's Regency Romances. And uh, more recently, uh, I was introduced to Patrick O'Brien's Aubrey Matron series, and from there to C.S. Forrester. Um, and that sort of swashbuckling adventure comes in and mixes up with the um, wonderful sort of social comedy um, of, the, of, of Jane Austen's work. And so it's a, a wonderful era to play around with. Well, let, let's talk a little bit about um, kind of what, what's going on in the society. The dragons exist mm -hmm. and are used for warfare. Yes. Uh, and have been for a while. They've been breeding mm -hmm. and, and, and all that to, to breed different kinds of dragons for yes. different things. And the kind of dragon core is its own little society. Yes. Um, it was a lot of fun to sort of play with the idea and figure out how, um, how dragons would have interacted with the society. Um, and of course, I, I used a lot, I had a lot of inspiration from sort of naval warfare of the era. The idea of using crews on dragons was something that struck me as, as a lot of fun uh, and something that hadn't been done before. To, to have multiple people sort of trying to maneuver on the back of a dragon in mid-flight seemed like a lot, of, a lot of fun and sort of a technical challenge as well. And, and a little scary, too. Yes, <laughs> when, yes. Yeah, and that was a, one of the fascinating parts of the book was the training, the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the complicated harness they had on the dragon, and then the crew, you know, like you said, work, training on moving across the dragon yes. through the harness, trading muskets back and forth because they're shooting off the dragons, mm -hmm. and there's kind of dragon dog fights and, and boarding parties, and as they're also dropping bombs on ships, mm -hmm. and the formations with the different kind of dragons was... was Oh, fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what did you did you base that on any particular uh, aerial war? Combat? No, you know. In fact, um, I I think that the danger is when you're trying to turn dragons into an air force is the same as when a uh, modern writer treats horses as motorcycles um, or cars, where basically the horse can just go at top speed uh, and you just need to top it up every few miles. <laughs> Um, with some hay and water, and uh, I generally sort of specifically wanted to avoid treating dragons like jet fighters. So the research that I did was much more sort of looking at um, other uh, sort of animals, um, the research that's been done on pterosaurs and pterodons um, to find out, you know, how fast these kinds of creatures can move, and then looking at the tactics um, and strategy of the era that were used in land battles, in naval battles, and trying to extrapolate from that, how would people who thought this was how war should be fought, how would these people use dragons in warfare? Um, and that was really the way my, my research worked. And, and it works beautifully. The, mm -hmm. the, the feeling of the period and mm -hmm. the feeling of the time, uh, the language in it is, is, is really spot on. Um, I, I was particularly struck, as my wife was, as he calls this dragon, my dear. Yes, because that's what they did then, mm -hmm. and and I you know the, it just felt like you were back then. Yeah. There's there was a much greater sort of intimacy, um, just sort of accepted between uh, between close friends um, than would be than would be expressed today. A lot of times, it's it's interesting that you mention that phrase because I have uh, a lot of readers sort of react negatively to it, and many readers love it. Um, and almost all the readers who, who react negatively are always men. And women almost uniformly love it, and then about half, men are sort of split halfway down the middle, whether they, they like it or they're, they're sort of struck by the incongruity. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't particularly incongruous for the time, for a really close relationship. And the, uh, it's true, and, and it, 
the relationship between the riders and the dragons, men and women, and that's yes. something we'll talk to you a bit about. I love one of the th one of the things that struck me about the book is because let me put it this way: there's in a lot of historical novels, uh, people want to have active women characters, and sometimes yes. they're dragged in with 20th century sensibilities, mm -hmm. right. forced onto this time where they wouldn't yes. work. But you had a, have a very clever way of working it with the way kind of the Dragon Corps right. works. Right. The way that I um, envisioned it, I wanted to have women characters such as Lawrence's mother um, and his fiance, who were very much historically accurate women of the period. Um, and then I did also want women to get to participate in the swashbuckling adventure side of things. Um, and so I came up with the idea of the breed of long wings who will only take female captains. Um, and because of the situation that I set up, which is that Britain is so desperately short of dragons, that in general, dragons are extremely rare, hard to come by, hard to train, no one's going to sacrifice the opportunity of putting these extremely powerful dragons into play um, just because of sort of social mores. Um, and the way that I feel that works is the same way that Queen Elizabeth I um, could rule the country, um, that these are women who are viewed by their male counterparts as exceptions to the rule, as, as honorary men. Um, and I think that's very different than trying to change the, um, the historical attitudes towards women and the role of women. Um, for instance, Lawrence actually adjusts pretty quickly to the idea of female captains, but that's because he's really accepted these women as, as these sorts of exceptions, as opposed to really changing his underlying ideas about the, um, the, the rights of women um, and the role of women. And, and the women that are in the Dragon Corps, <coughs> they, they can't go out, in a sense, in right. public. Yes. As, as, in a sense, themselves. Exactly. In the way they're dressed, they have to kind of pretend when exactly. they go outside. And that Dragon Corps is its own little society, mm -hmm. separate from the other society, which is a problem for Lawrence. Yes, very much at so. At the beginning. Very much so. Um, which I, I like the idea of making um, the, the aviators a, a class apart, it seemed to me, was natural because they've got these massive dragons that don't naturally fit into the society of the period, that don't fit into these cramped, narrow street cities um, of the time, and that would frighten most people who weren't raised with them, um, and which would require enormous amounts of livestock. So when you think about it, dragons really can't just be parked in a city. Um, and so extrapolating from that, their attendants, their officers, have to live far away from society um, and would sort of naturally tend to, um, to sort of lose some of the social graces and become gradually a sort of more outcast class as opposed to um, what you frequently see, which is that dragon riders are sort of an elevated class. And I thought it was fun to play with the idea of a gentleman unwillingly forced to become uh, an aviator. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's a, the beginning of the first book when he is, when uh, the dragon Temeraire yes. kind of uh, chooses mm -hmm. him as his captain. He is not happy about it. No. He's quite upset because it's going to mess up his entire life. He had his life nicely planned out. Exactly. He was successful. He was hoping to get married soon. <laughs> um, his family approved of him. Uh, he was, he was sort of on a good career track, and then all of a sudden this dragon drops into his life and basically starts gradually disassembling everything um, that he's sort of taken for granted about his life and his own attitudes, in fact. Yeah, and, and the, the dragons themselves are fascinating characters. Um, it was almost, I imagine, like a science fiction writer writing, trying to write an alien mm -hmm. character because yes. these are, you know, sentient, intelligent creatures, but they're not human. Yes. They don't yes. think really like, they're not like big humans with wings. Right, exactly. I, I very much wanted to keep, uh, have dragons sort of think differently, uh, approach the world differently, and for me, dragons are predators. They're tremendously successful um, predators who are given to to combat in a way that people necessarily aren't. The people are much more sort of social. Um, and so I definitely have tried to keep their personalities and their attitudes um, 
distinct and alien is exactly the right word that I would use for that. Now, you came to write these novels from a very, kind of a strange background mm -hmm. to be doing this because you you were in computers yep. and in fact were computer game design mm -hmm. on Neverwinter Nights. Yes, yes. Um, it's interesting. I. Uh, I seem to always tend to, to flip from, from doing one thing as work and one thing as play. Um, during my undergraduate years, I was an English major, um, and I started playing computer games um, and programming on um, computer games as a hobby, and enjoyed it so much that I decided I wanted to basically go back and get a graduate degree in computer science so that I could work on computer games. Um, and while I was doing this, I started writing as a hobby. Um, and working on Neverwinter Nights was a really wonderful experience because um, we were a small team. We were working on the expansion set, Shadows of Undertide. Mm -hmm. And so I really got to be a bit of a jack of all trades um, because we were a small team and all of us got to sort of do anything that we really wanted to do. Um, and I originally came onto the team because of my programming background. I was going to handle um, do a little bit of design and um, handle the programming uh, for the expansion set within within um, the system uh, that's included as part of the game. And as time went on, I started. I became more involved in the design. Um, I helped work on the overall uh, arc of it, and I really found it a tremendous learning experience in terms of writing a long form because we had to design an arc that would last for 30 hours and it had to be subdivided up into uh, sort of three acts so that each designer could work on an individual piece. And then I got to take the third act and work on that sort of specific chunk and break it down into subplots um, and accomplishing the various narrative goals. And I really found that that taught me in a way how to write uh, a novel length work, where before I'd really only written vignettes, um, short stories, uh, almost nothing over 10,000 words, really. So this is your first? This is my first novel. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's fascinating, because I would not have realized the carryover between the computer game design and writing a novel like particularly like this. Yes. It's you know, with your background, I would have thought it would have been a, you know, a game novel. Right. And, uh, you know, I think that the, the difference is what, a, what working on a computer game can't teach you is the craft of writing, the craft of creating memorable characters, um, the uh, craft of, d of description, because of course computer games have the visuals <laughs> these days. Um, and so all that you have to already have, but what computer game design does have in common with a novel is the architecture, really. Um, that, that sort of scaffolding that you have to hang all the rest on. And I think when you're writing at the short story length, you can get away without an architecture. Um, but at the novel length, I've, I had tried, in fact, sort of made sort of scribbling attempts at early novels, and they would always sort of fall apart at a certain point because there wasn't enough of a structure to, to let the story flow. Hmm. Well, because His Majesty's Dragon is the first one. Mm-hmm. That's and right. Throne of Jade is out. Yes, that's right. Which is the, the second novel mm -hmm. in which, and I've just started it. Yes. But it, it looks like in this one they, they actually go to China. Yes, yes. So that took you into a whole new mm -hmm. realm oh, of, yes. of, of, I'm that, sure, of research. That required, uh, in fact, considerably more research, um, historical research, because I've been uh, interested in the Napoleonic Wars and in Regency England for so long. I mean, I think I, I read the higher books when I was nine or 10, um, and Austin a year or so after that, uh, that I really had absorbed a lot of it by osmosis. Um, but then Chinese history uh, of the early 19th century, I knew almost nothing about. Um, and I had to do a tremendous amount of research into that period uh, to, to be able to write Throne of Jade, wow. which was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Yeah, it must have been. It must yes. have been. I can't wait to get further into it and see what goes on. Uh, the third book was out here. It says Black Powder War is mm -hmm. coming out like any day now. Yes, on Tuesday, ah, actually. And uh, I don't know when it'll be when you people see this, but <laughs> it's Tuesday now. Yes. Um, 
Now, are all three of these coming out like the first one did in hardback in the UK? Yes. And then yes. trade the paper US here? and the UK decided to follow sort of two different marketing strategies. Um, it, and of course, the US marketing strategy is the more strategy <laughs> is the more unusual one. Um, in the UK, they're, they're bringing them out in hardcover, waiting uh, six or so months, and bringing it out in uh, softcover when they bring out the hardcover of the second book. Um, so that's going to be appearing in the UK in, in August. Um, whereas here in the US, Del Rey has um, tried this, has used this technique previously um, with other genres. They've used it in, uh, Random House rather, has used it in romance and in thrillers, and they found that it works very successfully to introduce a new writer to readers who uh, might otherwise not see their work, might not sort of pick their work out of the shelf, and that they found that it really builds momentum and excitement about, um, about the characters, about a world, about an author's work. And I was really thrilled that they wanted to do this. And of course, what that means is they have to bring that out in mass market. Right. Because uh, in hardcover, nobody's going to buy three hardcovers in three months, <laughs> really. And uh, I, I actually am really happy about it because it also lets me provide more story to readers who, and I remember, you know, myself, um, I, I love to have all the story as quickly as possible um, and, and constantly want more. So, so is there going to be more that. after these three? There is. Uh -huh. um, I do uh -huh. envision each book as sort of a standalone plot, uh, a standalone adventure, even though the characters' lives continue on. Um, and so I try to wrap up each major plot within one book so it's not this horrible sort of cliffhanger ending. Uh, of course, then Del Rey has included the first chapter of the next book in each at the back, so people can torture themselves with a cliffhanger <laughs> if they want to. But it's at least an option. Um, and the the fourth book we're hoping will be out in spring of next year, uh, provided that I can write it fast <laughs> enough. So, are you going to keep going in this world? Or are you planning yes. on branching off other places? Or? Both. The answer oh, is okay. both. Um, I I do want to branch out. Um, I have some ideas for, for urban fantasy, um, for straight historical fiction, um, various other genres that I just, I have a lot of ideas and it's waiting to see which one sort of... Um, Percolates up. Exactly. Well, th these are wonderful books. I look forward to whatever you're coming up with thank next. Thank you very much. And we're out of time. I want to thank you for uh, joining us here. Thank you. It's been and a pleasure. I'm glad. And so, from all of us here at Fast Forward, this is Mike Zipser saying, take care.